This is one farad. That's one million times the capacitance of this one microfarad capacitor, or one trillion times the capacitance of this small one picofarad capacitor. Something's gotta happen soon. And today we're going to be talking about some capacitors and how they work. More specifically, supercapacitors. And maybe at the end of the video, we'll blow one up just to see what it looks like. So let's get started by talking about what a capacitor is and how it works. Now, first off, we're going to start with one of these air trimmer capacitors to show you basically how a capacitor works and how there are so many different variations of different capacitances. So in a trimmer capacitor like this, which is actually given to me by Keystone Science, you've got some of these plates and they're separated by air. Now, these plates are very closely spaced together. As you turn it, it moves the plates closer and farther together. Now basically, the capacitance of the capacitor is determined by three main factors. The first factor is the surface area of the plates, because these plates aren't flat like you see in the picture. They are square or something like that, so they have a surface area. So the surface area of the capacitor is one major determinant in its capacitance. The second major determinant is the space in between them. If capacitor plates are closer together, it'll have a greater capacitance than if they're farther apart. Same with the area. If they have a greater surface area, they will have a greater capacitance than a smaller surface area. The last main determinant is the middle inside. That is the dielectric. Now the dielectric can be almost anything that's an insulator that goes in between the two plates. It can be air, it can be plastic, it can be just about anything that doesn't conduct. Now basically what the dielectric does is it stores the electro electrostatic field between the two plates of the capacitor. Now dielectrics are measured by something called a dielectric constant, and that is how much they can hold a, an electric charge in. So for example, air is has a dielectric constant of somewhere around 1.005 or 1. Point something like that. And it's very, very relatively small. And as you get to other things such as plastic, like this plastic, it's got a dielectric constant of something like 3 point something. I'm not exactly sure. Now some things can have extremely high dielectric constants, up to 100 or even more. Now these materials are specifically engineered so that way they can have a high dielectric constant and a high breakdown voltage. Now breakdown voltage is how much voltage it takes to break down a certain material over a certain distance. And this is also very important to note when you're dealing with capacitors because you don't want electricity to jump between these two plates or a short to happen. Otherwise your capacitor is basically useless. There are a wide variety of different capacitors, different amounts of capacitance. For example, this trimmer capacitor has a capacitance of somewhere between uh, 200, or more like zero, and 300 picofarads. Picofarads are an extremely small amount. Probably when it's in this position like this, it's maybe 20 picofarads, maybe a little bit less. But then you can move up to larger capacitors, such as uh, one of these capacitors that is one microfarad. This one microfarad capacitor has one million times the capacitance as one of these one picofarad capacitors. That is an extreme difference. Now, if you want to see another extreme difference, let's take a look at a supercapacitor. Now, supercapacitors are w extremely big and have an extremely large capacitance. This is one farad. That's one million times the capacitance of this one microfarad capacitor, or one trillion times the capacitance of this small one picofarad capacitor. That is crazy. Let's figure out how these capacitors can be so different, and how this capacitor, which is not that much bigger than this capacitor, can be one trillion times the capacitance. Here we go. You can't have a Tanner Tech video without sticky notes. So, let's look at some constructions of different capacitors. Like I was saying before, capacitors are basically just plates separated by some kind of dielectric, and the distance apart is a very big factor in changing the capacitance. So let's first take a look at one of these small one picofarad or maybe three picofarad or something capacitors. These capacitors are have a dielectric of ceramic, and that is has a very low dielectric constant. So basically you've got two little plates inside there, or maybe three plates, or maybe four plates, and they're all kind of connected like this, and they're encased in ceramic, and it kind of looks like this capacitor inside, only encased in ceramic. Then we move up to some other kinds of capacitors called electrolytic capacitors. These capacitors are a lot different than the ceramic capacitors. So electrolytic capacitors basically have the same structure as a ceramic capacitor in that they have 
plates separated by a dielectric, but the plates are extremely close together, and the dielectric has a very high dielectric constant. Now let's take a look at a cross-section of one of these electrolytic capacitors on the inside. So you've got an aluminum foil plate, and that is probably going to be your anode. That's going to be the positive part of your capacitor, because remember, these electrolytic capacitors have different um, positive or negative signs on them. You've got one side, and that side's positive, and one side, and that's negative, and that's for a special reason. So you've got your positive plate of the capacitor, and the, the people who manufactured these capacitors actually used a special process to build up a layer of oxidation on the point of the capacitor. And this layer of oxidation actually serves as the dielectric. Now this oxidized layer is extremely thin and it has a relatively high dielectric constant, which allows for a very high capacitance in this electrolytic capacitor. Then you also have the electrolyte on the outside. And this electrolyte is not really a liquid, but it's more of a paste. And this paste kind of like goes on the outside and the second plate goes right there. And that is the negative plate. And this electrolyte basically conducts electricity, and that forms the two plates of your capacitor. So in this electrolytic capacitor, with this giant roll of rolled up uh, aluminum foil, allows you to have a very thin layer of dielectric, and it allows your plates to be very close together and have a high dielectric constant, which allows this capacitor to be one million times the capacitance of one of these capacitors, and this capacitor is definitely not one million times the size of this capacitor. Let's see if we can crack this little capacitor open to see what it looks like inside. All right, so if we take a look inside this electrolytic capacitor, which I took the top off, you can actually see how the inside is just surrounded by these many, many layers of aluminum and some other kind of dielectric inside. Now, not all capacitors are made using that gel type electrolyte. Some of them can be used using a liquid electrolyte and they're separated by this little layer of uh, insulation or porous insulation for that electrolyte to fill in. But either way, this is kind of showing you how many layers are wrapped around so that they can get all that surface area. That's a lot of layers. Now I was talking before about how one plate has a layer of oxidation on it and how there is a certain breakdown voltage between the two plates. And most capacitors state that uh, typical breakdown voltage. So if you look at this capacitor, the breakdown voltage is 50 volts and the capacitance is 0.47 microfarads. That means that the voltage it takes to break down the dielectric barrier between these two is 50 volts. Now that's a, it's a pretty, pretty good amount of voltage. But what's interesting is if you reverse the polarity of these two plates. So right now the positive plate has this oxidation on it. But if you switch this around to have this negative and have this plate positive, then the oxidation can actually be broken down. And if that oxidation is ever broken down, then it will cause that dielectric to go away, and it'll cause a short to be made between the two plates of the capacitor. And now you've got that liquid or gel electrolyte inside. Now what happens when you have a short? You get heat. That heat's gonna boil the electrolyte. The electrolyte's gonna boil, turn into steam, and as soon as it turns into steam, inside one of these sealed little can capacitors, well, you're gonna see a pretty big explosion. Here's a real quick example. I have this little electrolytic capacitor. I'm gonna stick it inside this little tub, so that way it doesn't uh, get too much smoke in my room. And we're gonna see what happens when this thing is wired backward and when we put too much voltage through it. One amp, this thing's gonna blow. Oh, as you can see, the electrolyte boiled, and as that electrolyte boiled, it popped the capacitor and filled it with smoke. Well, enough with these measly uh, small value electrolytic capacitors. Let's take a look at some super capacitors. Now, I have a few different super capacitors here, not that many actually. I've got these capacitors, and these capacitors are one farad at 1.8 volts each. And these capacitors actually were taken from an old VCR unit. And I'm pretty sure they were used for storing a voltage to run the clock instead of using one of those button cell batteries. I have some other super capacitors right here. I got these from LCSC components. I'll have the link in the description. 
Now, these supercapacitors that I got from LCSC have a capacitance of 0.47 farads, or half a farad, but this capacitor has have a voltage of 5.5 volts. That means the breakdown voltage is 5 volts. That's pretty good. These capacitors only have a breakdown voltage of 1.8 volts. So if we put these two capacitors together in parallel, then we'd have a capacitance of 1 farad at a voltage of 5.5 volts. It's a lot better than these capacitors. You can tell these small button cell uh, supercapacitors are a lot newer than these old can style uh, electrolytic capacitors. All right, let's look how these supercapacitors work. So remember how I was telling you about those electrolytic capacitors and how they can maximize the distance between the two plates? Well, supercapacitors do the same thing, but they actually are able to maximize the surface area of the plates. So normally, in aluminum, you've got the surface and it looks kind of like this. Now in some supercapacitors, like graphene supercapacitors, what they do is they put a conductive substance on top of the aluminum to maximize the surface area. So if you have bumps on the surface of the capacitor, then these bumps will have their own surface area. And so you would be almost doubling or tripling the surface area of this capacitor. Now this is just if you add this small conductive substance to it. But if we add graphene and look at this supercapacitor on a microscopic level, it almost does have a million times the surface area of one of these smaller electrolytic capacitors and the plain aluminum plate inside it. So these supercapacitors basically use the same principle as the electrolytic capacitors, except that they're able to maximize the surface area on the aluminum plates. And they also use a very good electrolyte inside them too. That electrolyte has a smaller breakdown voltage, which which shows why these capacitors have only a 1.8 volt breakdown voltage inside them, as opposed to the 100 or 63 volt breakdown voltage inside one of these electrolytic capacitors. So that makes them so much smaller. So it's very interesting when you look at how the plates inside these capacitors are made because they use the graphene or some other types of substance to make them have a greater surface area. Are you trying to investigate what these supercapacitors can do? You want to help me in my science? Very interesting. All right, it's time to see how well these new capacitors can hold a charge. Let me charge up this new supercapacitor to a voltage of 4.3 volts. As you can see, it charges up pretty quickly. And then we can try out the buzzer on this thing. We got negative over here, positive over here. Ooh, that's loud. Now I'm not going to leave it on there because I've tried this before and the buzzer runs for a very long time with this supercapacitor. It's just crazy that such a small capacitor can hold so much charge. It's amazing how science has progressed. So that's a very basic demonstration of supercapacitors and how well they work. Now these are just small supercapacitors. You can get supercapacitors that are on the order of hundreds of farads. That's just crazy to me. Well, I've always wanted to see what happens when you blow up a supercapacitor. And I have these old supercapacitors that have kind of outlived their usefulness because they're very large and they don't have very high capacitance relative to their size. Now I got a comment asking me if I could blow up a supercapacitor. So let's see what happens when we blow this thing up. Now here's my test chamber. So I've got this glass bell and in the back I have a computer fan and it's covered with some uh, carbon, activated carbon fiber cloth. So that way that can filter out some of the bad contaminants that are going to be released when this capacitor blows up. I've got my capacitor, I've got two leads coming out of it, and those leads are going into my variable power supply. And so without further ado, I'm going to crank up the voltage and turn on the fan, and we're going to see what happens when I pop this capacitor. We've got one amp running through that thing. What will happen? Something's got to happen soon. Ooh. Oh. Oh, nasty. Oh, as you can see, that fan cleared up the smoke pretty good. Holy guacamole. That's crazy. That was a crazy explosion. You see all that smoke and how loud it was? Well, 
Without further ado, let's crack this thing open and take a look at some of the carnage that was created by a gigantic exploding supercapacitor. Well, if you look inside, that jar is covered with this black powder. That's probably the um, graphene that was inside the supercapacitor that gave it its immense strength. My fan has this cap on it. Now, it's always good to be careful when you're dealing with capacitors like this, because capacitors can have PCBs inside them that can give you cancer and all kinds of other bad things. Here's my fan. I'll set that aside. Maybe clean it off a little bit. Now let's take a look at this stuff. You can see that there's graphene everywhere from the inside of that capacitor. And even right here, you can see this little thin plate of what could be graphene or some other unknown chemical. Whatever this is, it made a huge mess on my desk of whatever was inside that capacitor. You can see we've got a can right here. This can housed the capacitor. Can't find any of the aluminum plates. There's some stuff inside there we can pull out. You can see inside the capacitor, there's all kinds of graphene and other junk inside there. And that stuff probably allows it to activate, act as a supercapacitor. So that is some pretty cool looking carnage there. Especially with this little black plate and all the graphene scattered everywhere. You can definitely tell that the graphene is what allows this capacitor to be so super. It's crazy how much it deformed after it was blown up. This capacitor is crazy. It just completely crumpled itself and exploded. It's a good way to see inside them. Well, I'll get a cool picture of this carnage for my thumbnail and clean up this gigantic mess. But anyway, that was pretty cool. That shows you what happens when a supercapacitor explodes. And I hope I helped you learn about capacitors and electrolytic capacitors and all that stuff. Well, until the next video, thanks for watching. Please subscribe.